So we have started the second chapter of Second Peter, where Peter transitions from the reminders that he gave us in chapter 1, remembering our salvation uh, particularly, into helping us understand that Satan has agents in this world, among unbelievers, obviously, but right here in the church, masquerading as men and women of positions of title, um, positions that are significant, in leadership roles, teaching roles. And the purpose is not to come out and tell you lies, but to make you question what's really true. We'll, we'll read this morning that it was just a slight questioning that Satan asked Eve. Well, we assume Satan says the serpent. But he didn't come right out and lie to her. He made her question what God had said, whether it was true or not. And, that, and that's what our culture uh, as a whole is questioning right now. Truth. Can it be known? But even Pilate, uh, to Jesus' faith, says, what is truth? What is truth? It's interesting, right in the preface, or the preface, of our uh, Pew Bibles, it says this about the New Testament text. It says, There is more manuscript support for the New Testament than for any other body of ancient literature. Over 5,000 Greek, 8,000 Latin, and many more manuscripts in other language attest to the integrity of the New Testament. There is only one basic New Testament used by Protestants, Roman Catholics, and Orthodox believers, by conservatives and liberals. We, we, we don't have that in our government, do we? They can't even decide on whether they like the Constitution or not. Minor variations in hand copying have appeared through the centuries before mechanical printing began about A.D. 1450. What does that tell you? Well, that tells you that scholars do not debate the authenticity of Homer's writing. They don't debate the authenticity of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Those manuscripts don't even have a thousand copies, original copies. The Bible has 5,000 documents. It's amazing, and, and we should not doubt that what we have in our hands, hopefully every day, is the Word of God, proclaimed by His apostles, by His Son. We should have no doubt in that. And we, we have found, just in looking at the first three verses of First Peter, that a false teacher is a person who contradicts the Bible. They don't necessarily come outright and deny the authenticity of the text. Well, is it, is it really valid? I mean, does it really hold water in today's society? Is it really relevant among mankind now? There's been such changes. We can't possibly live that way. Yes, we can. And it is relevant. Even in this culture, it's my opinion, the only way, the only way to truly um, live your life, and I say that tongue in cheek because Lord knows I, I don't do it well every day. Um, but it's what we're to aspire to. It's what we're to use as our guide. Uh, call it an owner's manual for life through Jesus Christ. I, I don't know what the appropriate title would be, but if you've looked at an owner's manual or if you've tried to put together a complicated child's toy, um, the night before Santa comes, big mistake. 
Okay, I, I'll never forget uh, Claire's papa, Junior Whitworth, got the girls a Barbie Jeep. He spent hours putting on the decals. He says, I've put less decals on a sprint car. But it was done all with love and care and tenderness, and he followed the instructions. This New Testament, the, the Old Testament, the, the stories, the accounts we have are written so we can follow the instructions and have reliable instructions. So don't let this world make you doubt your faith, make you doubt the Word of God. I just want to start this morning uh, reading a few scriptures to you um, about what Satan is up to, what his minions are up to in this world. First of all, I want you to understand that Satan is the great imitator. He's the great imitator. Okay, As we go through this, remember, he's not trying to outright lie to you. Okay, He's trying to be subtle. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 13 through 15, Paul writes, For such men are false apostles. Now that word false is a synonym. synonym, synonym. We had synonym this morning. I can't even say that. A synonym to fake. The Greek word is plastos. What's that sound like? Plastic. Plastic's a fake. It's substitute made to look like something else. Oftentimes, plastic looks like wood. But it's not wood. It's plastic. It's a fake. It's a substitute. It's plastos. Such men are fake or false plastic apostles. They're a substitute. Disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. But when you disguise yourself, you're impersonating or imitating a character or another person. Like putting on a Halloween costume. Okay, I used to love that as a boy to go through the aisles of whatever store it was back then. I don't remember Walmart, but probably Ben Franklin would be my guess up on the square. And go through all the costumes. Oh, I want to be Superman. Oh, I want to be what? I want to be this. Okay. Wanted to disguise myself as one of those characters. Paul goes on to say, and no wonder. Don't be surprised. No wonder. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his ser servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Okay, Satan and his minions are imitators of righteous people. You see them on TV. You know who they are. You've probably bought their books. Those are called self-help books. The best self-help you can give yourself is to follow God's Word. Satan is also crafty and subtle with fervent attacks on humanity. He doesn't quit. He doesn't let up. He's, he's constant, constant. Listen to how he handles Eve, written in Genesis chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. That tells us a couple of things. Satan was made by God. It was part of God's creation. He created Satan. Now, right before this account, you'll, you'll read a, about how Godhead, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. It's a plurality. It always existed. When, when you see the word the Lord or Yahweh is how it's properly translated. You can know that that's the Godhead. All right? And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat 
of any tree in the garden? Really? Are you, are you sure you didn't misunderstand him? Are you sure? Are you sure he wasn't implying something else? And the woman said to the serpent, "We may eat of the tree, fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, "You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die." Hmm. God didn't say that either. He never said anything about touching it. Eve added that. Satan already crept in and got her to not only be confused, I guess, but to add to God's words, to incorporate new demands that weren't even there. Who, who did that to the Israelites in the New Testament that Jesus, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, they were adding to God's law impositions that didn't even exist, heaping burdens on the people. Jesus said, making them twice the sons of hell that they were. It's no wonder he called them serpents. He's comparing them to Satan's work. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, so he takes her doubt and her questioning of what God has said. Obviously, she's questioning it because she, she got it wrong. And he's adding on to her, um, I don't know if she's naive I mean, Adam was just plain stupid. She said, eat this. Okay. Whatever you say, dear. And he's just the dummy. Okay, Eve's the intelligent one. But he appeals to her, saying, this will be better. You'll, you'll be like God. Who wouldn't want that? So the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. So she took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Again, Satan's game plan for us is not to outright lie to us, but just as Eve, he wants to appeal to our eyes, to our flesh, and to our pride. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. John says that's the three ways we are tempted. And it played out right in the garden in the beginning. Satan is a great imitator. He's crafty and subtle. But he has false Christians. He has fake plastic Christians. Guys, I'm thinking that if I say this, it might be offensive, but I'm going to say it anyways. We see men and women alike who have work done. And we call it plastic surgery. It's fake. It's not real. Those aren't real. These aren't real. You know, this isn't real. He has fake Christians. Matthew 13, Jesus says, The field is the world. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. They didn't have Roundup then. And so they had to figure out the weeds and the good and the good plants, okay, the good crop. And Jesus uses that. In John 8, he talks about the Pharisees. He says, why do you not understand what I say? They could hear him. They could comprehend it. But he tells them the truth. He says, it is because you cannot bear to hear my word. Because I'm making inroads in, in what you're telling. I'm contradicting the falseness of your statements. 
the demands you're putting on the people. And he goes on to really insult them. He says, you are, you are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Satan has false Christians in this world. Some of them are leaders and teachers. Satan also has a false gospel. A false gospel. Gospel, a fake gospel, plastic gospel, not the real good news. What is the good news? Jesus died, was resurrected, and is in heaven, descended to God's right hand, and he's interceding for us. Paul writes about this in Galatians 1. Uh, some of you who are uh, participating in the uh, group chat Bible study, which I'm I probably need to put a little more time into that. Let me, let me tell you a quick story before I go on. Thursday, I was in Quincy, and I had a steer tire on my truck that needed replaced. So I went to Quincy Mac, which is owned by my owner, and uh, went in. Real nice guy behind the counter, and I, and I said, are you Jim? He said, yeah. I said, my dispatcher called, and I'm supposed to get a steer tire put on. Yep, yep. I said, okay, great. And they were still on lunch. And I said, so I just need to go in the office and set or what? He said, no, we got a room upstairs, break room. You can go up there if you want and have lunch or whatever. There's a microwave up there. So I went and got my hot dogs and my jalapeno relish that my mom made and the buns and went upstairs and nuked those hot dogs and was eating. And, and I'd been thinking, man, I really need to get something posted to the chat group, a question or something. Because I had been slacking. And I'm eating my hot dogs, and I noticed on the table, it's a big long table, there was a book on the table. I got done eating, cleaned up, and I, and I, and I sat down behind that book, a truck driver's lounge in Quincy that I'd never been to. There sat a book on Galatians. I'm not lying. Right there. Okay, Lord, I will read this and I will post a question right now. So I was just, you know, amazed. Here's, here's a commentary on Galatians, the same book we're studying. Incredible. So Paul says in Galatians 1, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not the one, not that there is another one, but there is some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. To distort something means to twist it or to bend it, to put it out of shape. You get the idea? They're trying not to outright contradict Scripture, but to add a little something or take a little something away or rephrase it or insert a word or a comma or a period or a question mark to get you to come up with a different conclusion than you would have otherwise. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach you a contrary gospel to the one we preached you, let him be accursed. Anathema. Anathema. As we have said before, now I say to you again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be anathema or accursed. So, he has a false gospel. Satan has false Christians. He also presents a false righteousness. A false righteousness. In Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 30, continuing in chapter 10, verse 4, Paul writes, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel 
who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but is as if it were based on works. That's the number one trick that Satan pulls on you and I. You have not earned your way into the kingdom. You have not earned God's grace. You are not worthy. But if you do these things, which have nothing to do with your salvation, if you do these things, you'll be saved. Think about the impositions that other denominations and churches impose on their congregations besides faith in Christ. Those other things have nothing to do with their salvation. It's only faith. Okay, And faith is much more than just believing. Faith is your act to the submission, your submission to the authority of Christ. What does Christ demand? Confession. He demands you confess His name. He demands that you repent of your sins, that you turn and follow Him, and that you are immersed in His name for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what He demands. That you believe those things and you obey Him. That your faith makes you believe those things and act upon that belief. It's showing you believe. It's telling you believe. Paul says, Israel has stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, he says, it is my heart's desire and prayer to God for them. It's my desire they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, and here it is, and seeking to establish their own, I'm a good person. They're good people. We're good. Scripture says no one is good. Your own righteousness is like filthy rags. Have you ever seen those red shop towels, those red cloth towels that are in mechanics garage that are filled with grease and oil and gunk? Kate may have even watched some. When he says, don't bring those home, throw them away and buy new ones. Not ruining my washing machine. That's what our righteousness is like. Rags full of grease and oil and dirt and nasty stuff. Our water, our cleansing powers won't wash away all that gunk. Jesus will make your robes white as snow. Okay? They established their own righteousness. They did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He fulfills the law and the prophets. The the law says, do not murder. Christ says, don't hate or you've committed murder in your heart. Listen, folks, we're all guilty of that one. Whether it is intentional or reactive, we're guilty of that. When we we are furious because we've been insulted or they've spoke harshly against us, this isn't like this isn't like spanking your child kind of being mad. 
Okay, but that's necessary sometimes. I got a lot of them. Ronnie knows. He says, I deserve them. Had it coming. <clears throat> Ronnie probably even spanked me. I don't remember. Probably wanted to. Lexi Bowen did. I cost her a lot of emergency room bills. I got those boys so wound. Anyways. Um, Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. So when you have feelings of hate, stop and count to ten. Take a breath. Remove yourself from the situation. Pray. Whatever you need to do. But don't let those feelings fester and boil and stay in your heart. Get rid of them. Let it go. I got to, I got to do that this week too. I had a guy that on the other end of the phone at the truck shop that I had an hour by the time I got there and I had it all ready. My speech was prepared, my guns were loaded, and he was going to understand that if it weren't for truck drivers, he wouldn't have a job. When I got to the door, I handed him the keys, and I said, here you go. That was it. But I wasn't going to handle it well. And I felt so much better after just walking away. I really did. So how do we respond when... Jesus or Jesus, Satan presents false Christians, a false gospel, and he he will also present a false Christ. Will. Second Thessalonians chapter two, Paul says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in that way. For the day will not come until the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. I believe the King James says perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Skipping to verse 9, he says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all powers and false signs, and love the truth and so be saved, because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. Because of that, those, those Christians that ought to be able to see who he is, Paul says God sends them a strong delusion so that they, they may believe what is false, what is plastic, in order that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. See, the proof is in the pudding. How do you truly recognize a false teacher, a false Christian, a false Christ? How they live. How they live. Do they exhibit in their life what they propose? So how do we respond? We, we are to stand firm against all of this. Paul says we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So, when we allow the Holy Spirit to develop us in our knowledge of Scripture, in our faith in Christ, that, that's called sanctification. And if you allow the Holy Spirit that opportunity, you will continue to mature until you take your last breath. Now you can deny that all you want. It's, it's the same as denying your conscience in a way. Your conscience tells you, don't do that. And then another part says, yeah, do that. The Holy Spirit
I can hear him sometimes. Seriously. It used to be my own voice. No, it's not. I can't tell you what voice it is, but it's it's more than don't do this, do that. It's it's more <laughs> it's it's more of a lecture in my mind, but it's not in words, it's in a feeling. It's in you know the end result of that. It's more than don't do or do. So sanctification by the Spirit, belief in the truth. We have to stand firm in those things. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the, to the traditions you were taught by us either our spoken word or by our letter. Hold firm to what Scripture says. Let it be your guide. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, very strong prophets in the Old Testament. I think they're called major prophets instead of minor. Okay. Um, Really good books to read, especially if you read in a study Bible where you can get the background of what was going on. Okay, But both of those prophets exposed counterfeit false teachers among the people. But the people continued to listen to the false teaching. I mean, Jeremiah and Ezekiel both exposed them. Because it sounded good, it convenient and easy, the people continued to follow the message. It was exactly what they wanted to hear, the false teaching. The message of the false prophets didn't worry the Jews. So Jeremiah addresses it in chapter 6. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Thou sh- They shall glean thoroughly as a vine, the remnant of Israel, like a grape gatherer passes your hand again, over its branches. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. And that would have meant something to the Jews. Uh, They're pagans. Uncircumcised ears, they hear like a pagan. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord to them is an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. Look, sometimes when you read Scripture, there's things we don't like. Well, I don't pay attention to that. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. People say, well, the God of the New Testament is so much more loving than the God of the Old Testament. Completely different circumstances. Completely. God took the patriarchs, developed the nation of Israel that would bring forth the Messiah. That nation became slaves to the Egyptians for 400 years. All they knew was foreign gods and foreign worship. So when God took them out of Israel or out of Egypt, he had to get Egypt out of them. And it required extreme measures. Therefore, I am full of the wrath of the Lord, says Jeremiah. I am weary of holding it in. And he quotes here, I think God, poured out upon their children in the street and upon the gatherings of young men. Also, both husband and wife shall be taken, the elderly and the very aged. aged. Their houses shall be turned over to the others, their fields and their wives together, For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. And here's where he talks about the false teachers. For from the least to the greater of them, everyone is greedy. Remember, that was a clear sign. Everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone 
deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly. Rub a little dirt on it. Don't bandage it up and dress it. Just rub a little dirt on it. Saying, peace, peace, for there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Wow. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. All right. Where's my pencil? There it is. few questions to consider. I mean, hearing all that scripture, and it was quite a bit. I'm sorry. What are some of the situations? Think about it in your mind. What are some of the situations that challenge Christians to live unspotted lives separate from the world's habitual sins? Now, we, we may disagree on what we think are habitual sins. Some may take liberty in some things than others do. Okay? And, and clearly that's, that's right. Um, you know, it, it's like this. Scripture doesn't condemn alcohol. It condemns drunkenness. Okay? So it, to you, if, if you're an ex-alcoholic, I guess, I guess there is no thing as an ex, if, you, if you're an alcoholic, okay, alcohol may be a habitual sin to you, but it might not be to someone else. All right, drunkenness is the issue. So what are some of those situations that you can think of that challenge Christians to live the kind of lives we should as followers of Christ in a world full of habitual sins? What are some things that are tough for you? Hmm? Overeating. Overeating, sure. Gluttony. Gluttony. Can you pinch an inch, right? And and honestly, it's so weird. Um, I, I've been losing weight, not on purpose, but uh, I've been losing weight because I've been eating less. Uh, not been purposely dieting or anything, but I, I made one subtle change. Instead of having a donut or three for breakfast, I now have a package of tuna. And I know you guys are going, ooh, I love it. One of those ranch tunas. Just eat it right out of the package. And, and I have so much more energy and I feel so much better. I'm losing some weight. Lost 25 pounds. So. But gluttony, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's tough. And, and when you're... When you're with your buddies on Friday night, I mean, everybody else is eating a big old plate of food. You know, it's easy to, to feel comfortable in that. Okay. Now, not everybody's going to look at that as a sinful proposition. Okay. But, but it's a form. And, and that lack of discipline can lead to others. Okay. So we see the danger in that. What else? I don't go to a bar anymore. Okay, it's not because I don't like the people there. It's not because I think that I'm going to lose my faith. It's not because I'm going to think people are going to say, "Oh, the preacher's in the bar." The real reason I don't go is because I would probably have a beer or ten. That's why I don't go. Okay, and and I have mistakenly in the past went and. Everybody wants to buy the preacher a drink. Because if he's drinking, we can be drinking, right? Yeah. And you go to the bar, I can go to the bar and I take my wallet and have a good time. Okay. I don't go to the bar anymore. But it has nothing to do with the people. It has to do with me. It has to do with the weakness I have. All right. Now, I'm not saying I don't ever have a drink. I'm not going to say that. I, I would be a liar. But I don't go to that situation where I know I would lose control of myself and become drunk. It's just too too much for me. Okay, so 
drinking situations for me. What else? Gossiping? Talking when you should be listening? Okay. I'm not accusing you of this, Gene. I'm just going to write gossip next to it. Because, because, honestly, honestly, right here this morning when we discuss prayer concerns, that can easily fall into a gossiping situation. I thought Bill was going to make a comment. I think you should add something else to that. Proverbs 10 is 19. What's that? Proverbs 10 and 19. Proverbs 10 and 19. All right, we will look that up. Okay. Anybody else? I used to not, I'm not going to write this up here because I don't even know if Scripture addresses it except that um, it's probably not treating your body like a temple, but I don't have a problem now. Um, although I had a recent episode um, where I uh, fell back, slid back. But when I first quit smoking, I didn't go into break rooms <laughs> where everybody was smoking. Okay. I think I think what we can see here is um, these habitual issues, I think we can struggle with them because they appeal to us. Okay, Maybe in ways that aren't healthy. May feel good. May be a popular situation. I don't know. But we can put ourselves in situations that aren't healthy for us. Okay? And so we struggle with that. We struggle with that. What? Let's move on to the next one. What, hid, what helps you live free from things like the obsession with money and self-indulgence? What helps you break loose of obsession with money or self-indulgence? Now, I know those are two different things, but... They're kind of the same thing. They go together in a way because a lot of times money buys the indulgence, right? So what are some things that you do or can do to live free from those things? Appreciate what you have. Very good. Appreciate blessings. Count your many blessings. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, it, it it's it's satisfaction, being satisfied. Okay, and 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 that has to be sometimes purposeful. Sometimes we purposefully have to be satisfied with what we have, so we don't, so we don't covet someone else's cabinets. All right. What else? Knowing what scripture has to say about. Bible, looking to the truth, God's Word, God's Word, that can be easy or it can be intentional, which isn't always easy. What, what does it say about the power of God's Word? Cutting and dividing both joint and marrow. It cuts you to the bone. It's a double edged sword. It will gut you. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? What are some things we can do? I think prayer is very effective. I know it's very effective. Um, if you're struggling with something, own it. Okay, that's that's 
a good way to deal with any problem you have is own it. And, and what is our reaction usually to problems? Deny. There's no problem here. Nothing to see. Own it. And who better to own it than the one who already knows? I don't care who you're hiding it from. You cannot hide it from God. So if you confess it to God, it's just like the alcoholic's first step. I'm an alcoholic, right? Admit it. Own it. Then pray the dangerous prayer. Three words. God help me. God help me. Okay, That's about as vague of prayer as you can ask for, but in your heart and in your mind, God knows specifically your need. Okay, If you've already owned up to your problem and are specific about it, and you just ask, God help me, Listen, owning up to something we've done wrong or doing wrong frees us from a burden. It just does. The guilt part of that burden, its I wouldn't say it's gone, but it becomes a healthier guilt than one that's destructive and, and keeps you down and make you miserable. Okay. It's good to have guilt that keeps you in check, okay, that reminds you. All right, last question. Let's, uh, let's look down here in our text just a little bit. We're going to go past Noah. <clears throat> Peter says, And if he, God, rescued righteous Lot, how many of you thought Lot was righteous? Peter says he was. But if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented or tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and then heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue you the godly from trials and keep the righteous the unrighteousness unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Okay. So how many Christians are like Lot today? Let me expound on that question a little bit. Lot chose. Abraham stood up with him on a high place. I don't remember if it was a mountain or what. And said, let's not squabble over the land and its resources. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You want the left, I'll take the right. Said, Lot said, I want that part. Where was that part? Lot pinched his, pinched, pitched his tent next to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he chose. He actually preferred that choice. Now, did he know what was down there? I think he did. I think he did. And he chose to pitch his tent among them. How many Christians today are like Lot? I know you're thinking lots. I know you're thinking maybe me. The old saying that your grandma or your grandfather probably told you, told you, you're judged by the company you keep. You're judged by the company you keep. Why do so many people assume, oh, you're just like them? Because you're with them. Participating or not, you live there. You hang out there. And you and I both know those people are probably not wrong all the time. Okay? I'm not telling you to give up friendships. I'm not telling you to give up family members. But there may be things that are unhealthy for you 
in being obedient to Jesus Christ. And you may want to change scenery. And you don't have to be judgmental about that. I, I remember as a teenager, I had a group of friends. We were all party boys, so to speak. And a couple of them were beyond party boys. Okay. And I remember the time that I took my mom's brand new car out and brought it home trashed, cigarette burns in the seat, holes in the seat, beer standing in the floorboard. My dad, I thought it was the only time he was actually going to double up his fist and hit me. I had to come. I was 17. I knew better. And when he had me up against the wall and I thought it was coming, he says, you can no longer hang out with him. And he named his name, and I won't. Since that time, that young man has been involved in a controversy as a suspect to murder. He was a preacher's kid. You're judged by the company you keep. Well, I was hanging out with the preacher's kid. <laughs> yeah. My dad recognized that was not a healthy relationship for me. And the sad part about it was I knew. But it was fun. We were having a good time. We weren't hurting anybody except my mom. That was a big deal, by the way. Okay? Let, let the Holy Spirit guide you and intervene for you and point out those people, those places that you will not grow spiritually if you make your bed with them, so to speak. If you pitch your tent with them, if you keep company with them, you know maybe there's the person that calls you other day, every day, and the conversation starts out with, "Did you hear? Did you know? OMG!" <laughs> you might want to take different calls. Okay, that might not be healthy for you. Because not only are you going to hear things that will probably burn your ears, or should burn your ears, you're likely to hang up and dial your next friend and repeat that garbage. Maybe even distort that garbage in a way where it sounds even worse. How do I know this is true? Because I know it's true. I know it's true. I've done it. I'm guilty of it. I try not to do it anymore. But in my past, I was guilty of that. Why, why do we repeat awful things about other people? One simple reason. I'm so much better than them. We elevate ourselves at the misery of someone else. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. And we don't do it on... Well, maybe we do do it on purpose. If, But if I were to ask you or ask myself, are you doing that on purpose? No, I would never do that. But we do it. We're in the moment. We're with the person. We're at the place where those things occur. Best way, the best way not to tell a lie the best way not to do an awful act, don't be there. Don't be there. Don't pitch your tent next to Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's pray. Almighty God, righteous Lord, so many things have come to my mind that 
I feel so inadequate in praying this prayer to you this morning in your house. Father, I know just like so many here this morning, Satan would love to convince us that because of our past actions, we're not worthy. And for those of us that have been incredulous, doing debauchery, that's it. sometimes an easy sell from him. And we can wallow in our guilt, and we are no use to you. But we can lay that all aside, knowing that it's always going to be a temptation, knowing that it's in our past, and people know about it. But we can be confident in knowing we are not that person anymore. Well, I saw you doing this. I saw you doing that. Well, yeah, we still have hiccups. We're going to continue to fall on our face. But the difference is, is we care about pleasing you now. And we want to continue to please you. Father, work on our hearts so that our minds can be active in clearly defining the gray areas in making black black and white white. And making the right choices once we have determined that. And, and Father, more than that, help us to be proactive in seeking out your word for truth not reliant on the opinions of others, not reliant on what's prevalent in society or culture to steer us clear and make it okay. We, we need to have contrite hearts, Lord. I know this, this message was full of all kinds of accusations, and I'm not trying to throw darts at anyone. I'm... I, I am l a target littered with holes. Lord, heal us. Fill in those gaps and voids in our heart. Help us understand true peace and true satisfaction, as Jill pointed out this morning. And help us understand the real love that is available for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, it's at this time that we come together as a congregation and we proclaim Jesus as Lord by the demonstration of the emblems that we were, will take of. And, and as we do that, Father, maybe this is a time that, that we need to own up to something and, and we need to repent that this is the time where we signify, I'm turning away from that, God. I'm giving that up. Not because we want to do better, because we want to please you. If we work at trying to please you, we will naturally be better. Thank you, Father, for this time and these saints that have gathered here this morning. I pray these things in Jesus' name.